Hello and welcome to The Big Picture. After decades of hostility between the United States and its allies and Iran, a deal to check Iran's nuclear efforts or in more simple terms to build a bomb has been struck. It is being hailed as a historic agreement which could change the equations in West Asia and Gulf in particular and world order in general. The deal struck after 13 years of standoffs and two years of intense engagement and 20 days of marathon talks, it is expected to bring huge relief to Iran. The US-led talks with Iran on one side and Britain, France, Germany, Russia and China on the other, the nuclear rapprochement has already had its effect on the crude oil prices, which has taken a southward turn. However, a few hurdles for the deal is yet to be crossed, especially in the United States of America, where it has to be voted in the Congress. Republicans have termed it a bad deal even as Israeli Prime Minister has dubbed the deal a stunning historic mistake. Today we will look at the fallout of this historic agreement and its fallout and how it would change the dynamics in West Asia and Gulf as well as internationally. And also how this would affect India. To discuss this I have with me Vivek Karju, former ambassador, Bharat Karnad, research professor in National Security Studies at the Center for Policy Research, Sheel Khan Sharma, former ambassador to International Atomic Energy Agency, Vienna, Professor A.K. Ramakrishnan of Center for West Asian Studies at the JNU, and, and on the phone line from Washington, D.C., is Chidanand Rajgata, U.S. correspondent and foreign editor at the Times of India. Welcome to all of you. Mr. Sharma, I would like to come to you first. You know, this, this entire deal which has been struck, you think this was the best deal which they could have worked out? Oh. I would go a, a step further and I would say after having gone through the, these annexes that it is better than the best deal that they could have. The annexes are so exhaustive. They have assured everything which the US fact sheet mentioned in, on April 2nd when the outlines were mentioned. They uh, ensured that Iraq, Iran's program will be reduced, its centrifuges will be 90% reduced. It's, uh, you know, centrifuges will be to, uh, reduced by 66%. The total quantity of 3.5% uh, uranium will be reduced to 300 kilograms. Uh, the the Fordow plant will not be allowed to do any enrichment. Iran uh, will not be able to sneak out because they will block all the avenues. And all this is there in the annexes. So it is not the U.S. fact sheet, but it is the annexes. And Iran has accepted it. And if you listen to President Rouhani uh, on the 14th, uh, he talked about it in philosophical terms, uh, about Iranian pride and in terms of dialogue and patience and forbearance. And his emphasis was on getting the sanctions lifted. And he said that the sanctions were unsuccessful in preventing Iran from developing its capability, but they were effective on the people. Right. So, that kind of a, uh, sums up the deal which was there, that they managed to create a, a capability which allowed Iran to bargain. And the West, in return for that, has lifted sanctions, which might give them $100 billion. Yes. So the deal, uh, the, the text of the deal, uh, you know, it far exceeds anything in the field of non-proliferation done so far. Done so far. That's very interesting what you said. Let me get uh, Chidanand Raj. Chidu, uh, what, is the, what is the mood there? You know, one of the, everybody is talking about how this, will, this deal will go through the Congress, what kind of hurdles will it face there, how will Obama be able to overcome it? What is the mood there? I think the mood is positive in the administration. They seem uh, fairly confident that they'll be uh, able to get this uh, through Congress, uh, despite this being an uh, election season and the Republicans, uh, you know, uh, uh, expected to take a hard line on this. Uh, the point here is that uh, when you discuss, uh, you know, whether it's the best possible deal, I think even President Obama has argued, and there's was, there was an extensive uh, interview he did this morning with Tom Friedman, uh, that uh, you shouldn't uh, let, you know, the uh, aspiration for the best be the end of something that is good. And I think he's successfully arguing that uh, at least for the next 15 years, this effectively blocks uh, Iran uh, from pursuing uh, 
uh, a path towards uh, um, nuclear weapons. Uh, that argument, um, I think, is finding broad acceptance, uh, like the ambassador uh, previously mentioned. The NHS uh, suggests that the uh, inspection regime is going to be uh, very, very uh, strict. Uh, and then there's always uh, uh, the option, uh, if Iran decides to chunk it, the U.S. and the allies have sufficient time uh, to initiate uh, you know, severe action, even military action. Uh, so, by and large, I think the administration has been able to sell uh, this deal uh, as something that's good. You also have to see it in, in the larger context. Uh, a lot of people are resentful, of, uh, particularly Republicans, of this um, deal because they see it as Obama trying to uh, sort of ensure his legacy. Uh, you, you know, this is the, in the third major country, the third country with which Obama has uh, done um, something remarkable turned around 40 or 50 years of entrenched thinking. You know, there was uh, the turnaround in uh, with Cuba, turnaround in uh, Myanmar, uh, and Iran. So uh, this is truly uh, something phenomenal in, in terms of ensuring political legacy, and a lot of criticism uh, centers around uh, a very pathological uh, a Republican uh, conservative dislike uh, for a Democratic president who's doing all this. Okay, but, you know, but you, you expect him to carry this through the, the Congress. Yeah, because the, the Republicans have reacted violently. They've said it's a very bad deal. And, you know, the, all, all, the, all the words which they could use, they've used. Yes, they have. And, uh, you know, there, 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 there is a sort of unspoken alliance between hardline Republicans uh, uh, and uh, Israel, the hardline Israelis. But you have to remember that even among Israelis, all this actually boils down to the dynamic uh, the, uh, the political and electoral dynamic, you know, uh, you know, what does the Jewish constituency here feel like? And uh, that's not a sort of uniform uh, constituency. That's not a monolithic constituency. There are a lot of um, liberal Jews uh, who are supporters of the Democratic Party who think, uh, who buy into Obama's argument that this is a good deal. Uh, it may not be the best, and that's the argument uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is making. He sounds almost like a U.S. politician or a U.S. congressman. Um, and he's been arguing that it's not the best, that it could have been even better. They could have squeezed uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, Iranians even harder. Uh, but I think a lot of them buy that, uh, you know, that it, it, is, it, is a, it is a good deal. Okay. Okay. Mr. Kaju, Mr. Sharma was saying that, you know, it is the, it's better than the best what one could well, have thought uh, of. No, but my uh, question is this. Why do you think the Iranians agreed to this deal? It, was it something that... They had no options after it. Look, uh, the sanctions were biting deep. And uh, what have the Iranians decided? I think on their part, they decided to postpone uh, the development of strategic... You believe that? a strategic option, yes. I think they've, they've bitten the bullet. And they've decided to postpone that option uh, because this deal is for 15 years. What they did not give up was their right to enrich, even though it's at a very low level. Very, very little. But that is something on which they have made, they didn't compromise. The Americans had to move from a maximalist position, which was to deny Iran the right to enrich. And once I think the Americans gave up their maximalist position and the Iranians decided that a postponement was necessary, then uh, the as the basic ingredients of diplomacy uh, was available. Before that, there was just no scope for diplomacy. And, of course, it's a monumental diplomatic achievement because this is a terribly complex uh, deal and a very technical one. As Sheila said, that it's, it's, uh, it has required great patience to ensure that legally all avenues and pathways uh, to, for Iran to develop anything strategic, a strategic option within this 15-year period would it's be close. denied to them. But, I, but uh, look, Iran is Iran. And many people who have dealt with Iran would be very wary. And uh, in that light, I think uh, some of the wariness and some of the skepticism which is there in some quarters, is not entirely you unjustified. You think it is justified. Mr. Karnan, would you agree with that? This, this, is, this is, is this a postponement? 
Yeah, basically, as a natural skeptic, I think uh, one thing is very certain, that all that Obama has managed to do is to, in his watch, not have an Iran problem. In other words, you don't have the prospect of Iran going nuclear uh, when he's the president. So he's put it and off much, to... And much after also. And he's put it off to another administration in the future when he, he's in retirement and he, he wouldn't care, I imagine. So that's the obvious politician stack to take, that you don't have a problem when you are there at the helm. Uh, that said also, the thing is, the scepticism also arises from the fact, I mean, I, along with a few other people, have, uh, were taken around the uh, nuclear installations in Iran a few years back. Um, I've talked to people there. And uh, one thing is quite certain, that even then, they were about as near to an actual bomb as you could get, without tripping over, assuming you believe what they said. Um, because you saw the wave it all, but until you talk to the people and, uh, uh, you know, in a sense, gauge the, uh, the, what they said. Uh, the point, I think, is technologically, I don't think it will be very difficult for them to cross the threshold into weapon status. Even, now, even, even under this? No, not under this. Given the fact that, as has been said, um, the Iranian society from Shah's time is very pro-Western. There are, the, there are the Bazari element in uh, the, uh, you know, bazaars of Tehran and so on, who have always been with the mullahs and the theocrats, the theocracy, and they have been the main pillars, really. So if you take that element out, most of the people want free access to the world for, uh, you know, the, uh, an open trading regime and so on, and they don't want to be, uh, you know, constrained Isolated. in the manner they have been for the last, since 79, and Ayatollah uh, Khomeini's... Uh, coming into Tehran. Um, so that, I think, so is the reason pressure, why... So the pressure from the people were there? Well, I think the popular street pressure uh, must have worked on uh, Rouhani and his cohort uh, into, saying, in, into saying, well, look, we are nearly there. We haven't given up our weapons option. We, our technological capability is not going to be in any sense, uh, you know, hurt because we'll maintain that level. And 15 years later, if necessary, after we have built up our own resources, built up our stamina and endurance uh, to, say, perhaps face sanctions in the future, we can then cross the threshold and see what happens. Mr. Sharma, would you agree with this argument? Uh, well, you know, uh, Iran, culturally, they are not like North Korea. They would fancy themselves something like Japan or Argentina, where they have capability and respect, and they are engaged into mainstream uh, global trade. So, uh, and Rouhani and uh, Sharif, they are both uh, of that ilk. Sharif has been educated in the, in the West, in the and West. Salehi, his uh, energy minister, they're all from MIT, and they... So these are the guys who want to connect with the, the West. And, you know, Rouhani's memoirs came two, three years back, where he has mentioned, uh, it's very interesting, he said that uh, talking to the uh, US is like driving a Mercedes car. Talking to the Europeans or the East Europeans is like driving a, a you know, a, a Skoda or something. <laughs> and talking to the non aligned is like driving a Pekan. Pekan is an Aryan car. Okay. So it is the kind of hierarchy which he felt in his mind that if you wanted to have a deal, you must talk to the Americans, which finally happened. Okay. Okay, uh, Professor Ramkrishnan. Professor Ramkrishnan, how is this going to change the scene in, in, in West Asia and the Gulf countries? How is it now? How, how will Iran's you know end of isolation work in these areas? The most important thing is that uh, Iran's uh, the the possibility of Iran asserting itself within the region has increased tremendously, uh, if not uh, immediately, but uh, uh, you know after some time when the sanctions are lifted, uh, when uh, economic uh, activity with the rest of the world goes on um, in an increased level. Um, uh, the Saudi skepticism would obviously increase. Uh, they are really worried about Iran. Uh, Iran's involvement in Iraq, um, in Syria, in Yemen, and with the Hezbollahs in Lebanon, uh, all that uh, kind of uh, space that Iran has developed over a period of time 
is, is going to, to impact the regional politics in a big manner. And so it, it, Iran always wanted uh, that regional status, and uh, this is an opportunity for it to, to realize that. Okay. Mr. Kaju, uh, this regional status, and, you know, it's enhanced you know, economically, enhanced strength economically and otherwise. How is it going to, how is it expected to use it? Look, uh, I look at it like this, that the regional order in West Asia, uh, which uh, evolved after the traumatic events of, and the historic events of 1979, and they, those events were not limited to Iran only, uh, is now finally coming to an end. It was closing in, but it's now finally concluding. And a new order is, is going to arise with a more assertive Iran, gradually, as the professor has said, it will, I don't think there's some, something will happen overnight. But uh, there have been signs over the last two years how the Iranians have right. been asserting themselves uh, in uh, the Shia uh, areas of the Middle East. Uh, now, the interesting play will be now between three uh, poles, should we say. One would be the Arab Peninsula, countries where Saudi Arabia, and uh, the second would be the Israelis, and the third would be Iran. The interesting thing is that North Africa, because Egypt was supposed to be the heart of the Arab world, but North Africa is in disarray, and I don't, including Egypt, and I don't see that settling down anytime soon. Uh, so now we'll really have to wait and watch. They're full of, there are many imponderable factors. Absolutely. Uh, but there will be a game in play. That, that game in play, Mr. Karnat, well, let, us take, let us look at it from India's point of view. How do you look at this deal from India's point of view? Well, I think uh, <clears throat> in one sense, uh, India lost a very great opportunity to build up a store of goodwill all these years when Iran was a pariah state and so treated by the West and the US. Uh, because, you know, uh, the problem was Delhi very quickly got onto the American bandwagon and the Western bandwagon in trying to isolate and so on. Because whatever our rhetoric, the fact of the matter is that we ended up, in a sense, riding the Western coattails as far as Iranian policy was concerned. Think of it, uh, turn the thing around and see if for the last uh, so many years, uh, nearly two decades and more, uh, you had you know, looked after your own interests. Why? Because Chabahar and access to Central Asia is very important for us, quite independent of our relations with the United States. Now, here you are. You didn't do all these years, you didn't do anything about Chabahar. You allowed the Chinese to come in, in a sense, into Gwadar. Uh, when we only talked and talked of Chabahar, we should have invested, we should have got our connectivity going to Central Asia and Afghanistan and so on, had everything ready by now. We don't. So, and mainly, we would have built up this goodwill because when everybody opposed you, uh, uh, is if there are people who side with you, you remember those people more. You have goodwill for them, Absolutely. quite apart from whatever interests you might have uh, in, the, in the exigent sense, uh, with uh, however you want to align with powers that be. So this is the problem. I think we had lost a great opportunity because any way you look at it, Iran becomes rather central to our geopolitics for all of West Asia and west of us. And also Central Asia. Well, west, of course, naturally. That's the yes. way to connect to uh, Central Asia. I know, you, I know you want to react to it. First, let me get him and then I'll come back to you. Yeah, Mr. Sharma, how do you react to that? You know, the Indian, looking at it from India's point of view. I would say that we should probably put uh, geostrategy uh, to a slightly, uh, you know, back, you know, seat behind. The Iranians are great uh, mercantile people. You know, the bazaar is very important. So the openings have been there and we should try and exploit them to the extent possible. Now, it is a fact of life that once they open to the Western world, uh, you have much bigger competition. Right. But that doesn't uh, drive out your advantage, which you would have had for, for years. So, like, uh, if you look at the trade with Iran over the last uh, three, four years, it peaked at something like $12 billion. Right. But the con concern now is that the increasing competition will reduce that, uh, you know, trade between India and Iran. We'll buy more oil because, you see, the oil prices are coming down. 
and we always distributed our, our oil supplies. So we, if you buy oil from Iran, the trade will automatically go up. And Iran's joining uh, with 500,000 barrels a day will bring down the oil prices. Oil prices so are already good coming for down. Us. $1 or $2 has fallen down, but it is good for us. The oil prices coming down is good for us. But other exports are going to be hurt. Well, uh, the refined, uh, you know, pet petroleum, for instance, petroleum refineries, we still export, and that will be good for us because... Mr. Mr. Kajjo? You know, I, I've always questioned the assumption that despite all the difficulties Iran was in, it was naturally oriented towards us. It was not. Iran, Iran, Iran had a, a different outlook. Now, Chabahar, for example, the Iranians themselves, I can assure you, were terribly uncertain about Chabahar because of internal contradictions within Iran itself. What And what were these? The... There was, of, of course, the Bandar Abbas lobby, but more than that, the Iranians are very cautious in allowing Chabahar in the route to uh, Afghanistan develop because of the, the Sunni tribes who inhabit that area. No, but what is the point? <clears throat> the point is that I think through these years, our diplomacy towards Iran has been absolutely fine. And the view that we so the, should have embraced Iran and that we didn't do it because of American pressures, I think is wrong. Why? You had far greater interest in the Arab Peninsula, and you still do. Let's not overlook those facts. Mr. You Karnad, have interest in, in, okay. in I, Israel. I, 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 we got to the point. Would you like to react to that? Yes. The, the point is, uh, you know, the, again, to reiterate what I said, uh, yes, the Iranians now have an, op now have an option. Many options. But, but, and you're just a lesser option now. Right. And they have no commitment anymore because you didn't do anything for them when they were down. Really, you didn't do anything. Any, any no, no, I know. But, but that still has a pull. You know, you might say that, in, you know, everything being equal, uh, all powers, are, you know, have the same kind of options. But, you know, the point I think is true. Iran has always been Western-oriented, as I said in my first statement. They always have been. But that's it. And they look on themselves as a civilizational power, you know, they, as legatees of Persepolis, Darius, Xerxes, and so on and so forth. But the point still is that had we done what we should have done, which is for our own interest, not because we <laughs> wanted to cultivate Iran, okay. uh, we would have been in a better situation. May, Professor Ramakrishnan, Professor Ramakrishnan, India, if, if you look at it from India's point of view, would you agree with, uh, you know, what, what Mr. Karnad is saying or you think... You know, India has, India has played its cards so far with Iran quite well and we should not have a problem. Professor Ramakrishnan? Okay, I think we'll let... Uh, but uh, going by the track record in recent times of how he has uh, managed Congress, uh, you know, uh, with uh, health care and trade issues, uh, I think there is a sense that uh, the momentum is uh, with them and uh, they're going to try and swing it. So I just wanted to point out that in, insofar as uh, India's position is concerned, this, in the interview this morning, uh, Obama cited, uh, you know, the pain that some of the U.S. allies uh, uh, were going through because of the sanctions on uh, Iran as one, one of the justifications for his deal. He actually mentioned uh, uh, India, South Korea, Japan, among um, countries which had uh, suffered because of U.S. Uh, sanctions on uh, Iran, uh, Iranian oil trade. Uh, and I, I think India, you know, did the best of a very difficult situation. If you recall, even during the U.S.-India nuclear deal talks, there were a number of congressmen who actually tried to make uh, Indian ties with Iran an issue, uh, you know, a hostage to the deal. Um, and I think there was a particularly different, a difficult passage during which uh, India had to do a delicate balancing act uh, between its buying its oil uh, from Iran and uh, reducing the quantum of oil it was buying from Iran uh, and then also, uh, you know, uh, trying to keep uh, Washington happy. I, I think uh, my sense was uh, India did a pretty uh, good balancing okay. uh, job. Okay. Yes, Mr. Sharma, very quickly. Yes, my point is that, you know, the extensive sanctions uh, would have not allowed you to even trade That's with Iran because... 
uh, all dollar transfers to Iran were blocked. Yes. So how would you uh, uh, exchange, you know? And you read the annex on these, these uh, things, on like lifting of sanctions. They will give you an insight into how they are lifting these blockades one by one. So to think that you can have overcome this, even China could not overcome this, despite the Chinese okay. things. <coughs> okay, sir. I think we are uh, completely run out of time, but this is an interesting discussion. We will have to, we, I'm sure there will be many more discussions when, when, when this whole deal will be worked out, when, when Americans, when American Congress, you know, approves it. Then we will, we will be wait and watch how it will all work out, whether Iran is going to, how, and how Iran will look at India and what kind of, what kind of relations will happen in the coming days. Thanks to all my guests. Please keep watching. We'll come back with another issue in the big picture same time tomorrow.